Good day and welcome to the tutorial on business process mining. My name is uh, Mieke Jans. I'm assistant professor at Hasselt University and this tutorial is uh, meant as an introduction into the field of business process mining. So let us first start with a short introduction. First of all, I'd like to point out um, the one and only and a good textbook on uh, process mining. So in case you want to have some further reading in a good textbook that introduces you fully in the field of process mining, um, the textbook of Will van der Haalst from University of Eindhoven is highly recommended. Also, um, parts of uh, slides are based on uh, the content of this book. So some background, um, I think it's not a big surprise for people to see this uh, figure. The figure shows the amount of data that is stored throughout the years. So it goes back to 1986 and it goes to 2007, so it's already actually an outdated figure. But we see here where we previously only had most of the time analog storage we now have almost always digital storage. The digital data concerns all types of information um, and it's very large and it's growing exponentially. So I don't think this is something very new to everyone. Um, but if we capture this, uh, we see most data in digital universe is unstructured. So it, there's a lot of data stored in a lot of places, but it's not always well, often it is not structured. So the big challenge is to, to extract information and value out of that unstructured data. Now it is also a fact that the digital universe and the physical one are becoming more and more aligned. What are we talking about? So for example, it used to be when someone asked you how much money do you have, you could have a look in your wallet and look at the physical money that was in it and so that was how much money you had. Now the amount of money you have are some bits and bytes stored at a bank uh, on a bank account. So it's not always a very clear distinction anymore between the physical universe and the digital universe. So they're really becoming more disentangled. Now on the other hand, so on the one hand we have a bunch of data and on the other hand we have the aspects on modeling. So we have a bunch of uh, buzzwords like BPM, Business Process Mining or Modeling, PAIS stands for Process Aware Information Systems and so those are just a few examples that rely heavily on process models. So Business Process Management is also based on we first have a process model and then we're going to analyze this model uh, to, with some KPIs and performance metrics etc etc. Now for these models we have a plethora of notations um, to uh, so languages to write down these models. We have Petrinet, BPMN, EPCs, different uh, languages. However a model of a process it's only as good as the alignment with the reality is. So if you have a nice language, a nice looking process model, but it does not fit reality, actually your quality of a model is very low. So this is just a slide with some examples of um, notations. So the upper one, um, this is a Petrinet, and it's actually the same uh, process model as this one in another language. Now if we combine all the, 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 the previous slides uh, into one story, we can say that, okay, given the interest in process models uh, with all the BPM talks, etc, etc, and given the abundance of event data, conformed the first slide, and given the limited quality of handmade models, we can say like, okay, we have to relate event data, which is already, which is over there in a very um, vast amount, and we we should relate that data that is there 
to process models and actually that is what process mining is about so this is uh, the BPM life cycle and so um, it's a very typical life cycle um, that expresses the phases of executing good BPM so actually you start with building a model so you design a model for a process that you need to be support uh, to support after building your model you set up a configuration of an information system that will support your process so you set up your configuration and you do your implementation then you're going to use that information system so then you're here enactment monitoring and while using that information system you're going to store a bunch of data now this data is an often used uh, extracted and used to run some diagnosis and then based on what we found based on the data there can be an error to redesign your process model like this the data and the process models are really separated so you have on the one hand these two phases so executing your process supported by an information system and diagnosing the data that is stored while you're uh, executing your process and on the other hand you have your models that are the uh, that are coming out of your design phase and which are the input for your configuration now bpm actually um, can get upgraded by using process mining because process mining is really going to link these two it's going to link the data with the models so this is a schematic overview of what process mining stands for um, it's used very often but it's also uh, very good and uh, clarifying so at the upper left we have the real world so actually the transactions taking place now these transa transactions in a process so think of any process that is supported by an information system um, so the transactions are supported by a software system like I said before the software system is configured based on a process model that was designed in a design phase which was designed to give structure structure to this world so the world the true real life transactions are executed supported by a software system and the software system excuse me is going to report an event log well process mining is about combining this event log with the process model so you can have for example for example the first arrow which only looks at the event log and extracts actually a process model which is called process discovery when you're going to have a look whether your process model is a good match with your event log then you're looking at the second arrow and we're talking about process conformance now if you have a look um, at your process model you start from your process model you have a look at your event log check the conformance and then redesign or re-engineer your process model then you're talking about process enhancement okay in pr process mining there are different perspectives the first perspective is the control flow perspective this perspective only focuses on the control flow so the sequence of activities activi um, activities following order so for example if you know for in procurement you first have to create a purchase order and only afterwards you can have goods received that is a perspective on control flow so actually the following order of your activities the organizational perspective focuses on the other hand uh, on the resources so the persons who execute the activities so for example again in the procurement process do we want to have that one person can both create a purchase order in the system and also receive the goods so it could be that a company says 
I want these two activities to have different originators. This is a thing that can be uh, an aspect that can be checked uh, and then we're focusing on the organizational perspective. The case perspective on the other hand focuses on other properties. So the first one is actually focusing on the timestamp, the second one organizational on who did it, the, the originator as we call it. And the case perspective focuses on other aspects. For example, if it's a certain type of a uh, purchase order, then another flag needs to be checked. I'm just saying something. So just focusing on other um, perspective on the case. And then the time perspective um, is concerned with the timing and frequency of events. So it's not the same as control flow perspective. Control flow perspective only looks at the following order. Time perspective uh, is, for example, concerned with uh, is there a time lap of one hour or maybe 10 days between activity A and B. So that's the time perspective. What we here see is, um, as said, an extract uh, out of the textbook of on process mining. It is a fragment of a possible event log. So what we see here is we have a case ID which can be, um, in this process, a ticket number. Um, so within, for example, insurance claims. And then we have different activities that take place on one case ID. So register request, examine thoroughly, check ticket, decide, reject request. We have of each activity a timestamp that was used to order this chronologically. We have a unique ID of each activity on that timestamp related to that case ID. And we have the resource who executed this activity. And further, we can store some extra attributes, as we call it, uh, like in data mining, attributes, characteristics, like for example, here cost, etc. etc. So, if we have a look at um, an example event log, there is a bare minimum that we need for process mining and that is the case ID and the activity um, and the timestamp. I forgot to put that um, on this um, in, uh, in right following order so and the timestamp. That's the bare minimum for process mining because that would allow us to employ a process uh, control flow perspective. Now if we have a table like for example this one, we can translate this information into traces. So case ID 1 had a trace of activity A, B, D, H, E, H. So the activities here are translated into the letters uh, register request, letter A, examine thoroughly, letter B, etc. etc. It's in here. Now, Process discovery algorithms are algorithms that focus on the traces that are recorded in an event log and tries to extract or discover the underlying model. Plus, and this is very important, it tries to discover the underlying model to replay all the traces of the event log plus more because there is a need to generalize the behavior in the log to show the most likely underlying model. Otherwise, you have the risk that you um, overfit your model, that it only fits to this log and from the moment an extra trace comes in which slightly deviates, it would not fit anymore in the model. We would not like to have that. On the other hand, your model might not be too broad that any trace would fit in because then um, you're underfitting. So the challenge is really to find a balance between your overfitting and your underfitting. So finding a model that describes the behavior of your event log and a little bit more, but not too much more. So here, for example, we find a process discovery algorithm found based on the traces it found uh, 
this process model. So this process model was able to replay all six traces plus some more. There are three um, terms. Play in, play out, replay. Play out is the classical use of process models. So you start from a model and then you say, okay, um, what are the possible traces if I play this model? Let's play out. Play in is the opposite. It's actually the process discovery we were just talking about. So you start from an example behavior in the form of an event log and you produce the underlying model. So it's going from data to a model. While play out is going from model to possible data. And reply actually uses produced data and the model. And then you can go to conformance checking, etc. etc. So giving an example, play out, as I said before, play out is starting from a model and playing out a model and actually finding all possible traces with this model. This model is written down in a language called Petrinet. Uh, it's actually a fun language uh, to show models in. Um, I'm going to tell you how to read this. So the rectangles are the activities, or called transactions. And a transaction can only be uh, executed when in the place before, so the circles are called places, there is a token. So the bullet here is a token. So activity A has only one incoming arc from one incoming place. So as soon as there is a token in this place, activity A can be um, executed. After transition A has been executed, it will produce tokens in all outgoing places. So the term terminology is that the transition A is fired, it consumes the token of the incoming place and it produces tokens in all outgoing places. The next step is in this example that activity D has been executed. So it consumed a token over here and it produced a token over there. Now, activity E is not able uh, to be executed because it misses a token over here. So now, or activity B or activity C can be executed. Here we choose for B. So B has consumed a token over here and produced a token over here. And now all incoming places before E have a token and E can be executed. And as a last part again or F or G can be executed and F is chosen. So playing out a model one time produced the trace A, D, B, E, F. You can do this multiple times and so you can end up with a bunch of traces, possible traces. Let's play out. Now play in is starting from the event log and producing a process model. Okay. This is called process discovery. Beware, for example here, ADEG is a trace that would not be able to be executed in this process model. So here we see this balance between overfitting and underfitting. In Dutch they have a funny word for um, what process mining actually is about or process discovery. It, it means uh, little parts of elephants literally translated, olifant patches. In English it's uh, less funny, they just call it desire lines. So actually what process mining is about is that you might have prepared a certain path to be followed, a procedure in your process for example. So this is the path that was designed, but however, actual behavior shows by looking at this little desire line, that's what it's called, 
that actually people are not following the pre-designed uh, process but taking, taking shortcuts. That's actually what process discovery is about. Here are a lot of um, trends um, which are all booming and all using analytics and um, in which process mining can certainly have an added value. Now I'd like to take you to uh, a software called Disco. It comes from Process Discovery. Um, it's a commercial software um, built by the company Fluxicon. Uh, Fluxicon is a spin-off of University of Eindhoven, who is very, um, very experienced in process mining. Here we go. Here we are in Disco. So, um, just for the record, anyone can um, ask for an academic uh, license at Disco. You just have to re uh, register Rutgers University in this uh, case, um, ask for an academic license, and then all students uh, can use an academic license. So, what do we see here? This is the process of procurement again, and this is the first uh, tab where you see all cases. What do we see here? The complete log, it's a random sample I took from uh, procurement with 10,000 cases. Now one case in this example is a line item of a purchase order. So this case, yeah, it's over here and here. It is a line, uh, it is purchase order 4500, etc, etc, line item 30. So that's how the case ID has been built. What we see here are the number of uh, variants. Now what is a variant? I see 336 variants. A variant is a certain way of executing your process. So for example, variant number one has been followed 30, uh, 3066 times and it looks as follows create purchase order, sign, release, invoice received, pay we find the 3066 cases that follow this variant we find them over here so we can open them all, have a look at them and we will see that each time the following order so the sequence will be the same because we're looking into one variant on the other hand, the other information, the resources, the dates, and all other information that I've stored will, uh, will change. So, 336 variants, so variant number 2 has been followed again 2378 uh, times, so it's not nothing. But if we go lower, we find variants with only 4 cases or 2 cases. A bunch of variants with only one case. So we see here the repetition, goods received, invoice received, pay, invoice received, pay. So it's due to partial deliveries that we have these unique uh, variants. You see here extra information that I stored. Now I see it's an event log from um, one of my first event logs that I built. So I did not um, store a lot of information um, goods received quantity the value of the goods received the value of the invoice received um, we see here it was an invoice and a credit note and then an invoice of the same value of the goods received so interesting um, and all these things can be checked um, case by case now the process discovery part is in this step that's the map so here is the algorithm that starts from the event log data that we find over here and it discovers the underlying model, process model. The, uh, the standard setting, put it here at 0%, which should be some other wording like default because it's not 0% of paths, and it shows the most common behavior in the event log. Now, um, if we increase this slider to 100%, it will show 
every single path that is present in the event log. So even if it's not significant, let me put it in that word, it is visualized over here. So you read this actually as a roadmap, meaning that the thicker the arc is, the more frequently it has been used, like the more frequently this path has been taken, and the thinner it is, the lower the frequency is. The same with the rectangles which represent the activities. The darker the rectangle, the more often it has been executed. We here only have a few activities. If you would have a process with, I'm just saying, 20 or 30 activities, you could also use your sliders and group together activities. I don't think it will work over here. Yeah, okay. So it then uh, calculates the correlation between activities and clusters, uh, highly correlated activities into one clustered activity. Now the blue screen focuses on frequency, so the darker blue uh, means more frequently executed. You can also have a look at the red screen, like I call it, and that focuses on duration. So the darker the line and the thicker the line in red, the longer it took to execute this step. Okay, so and then also you have mean duration, total duration, maximum duration. So these are the different views. So you see immediately, very differently than the traditionally based process models where you have only one model, one abstract representation of a process. Here you can very interactively say, okay, I want some more level of detail or less level of detail. I want to have an efficiency point of view with throughput times, or I want to have uh, just an overview of what occurs most of the time or what occurs not a lot of times. So and then the nice thing is that you can use a lot of filters. So for example you say um, I want to know more about this line. First have a good to see and then a change line. You can filter on it, apply filter and then you got here it's set, filter is on, we only have 1% of cases anymore, less than 1. You see here the 53 cases that had the following order of goods received followed by a change line. And indeed it is over here and it will be in all these cases you will find the sequence. Then you can go over to a drill down. As I said before I didn't really uh, collect the correct attributes over here or what's uh, too modest over here um, but for example if you have information on the supplier or the purchase organization or the purchase group you can have a look like okay which purchase organizations are more involved in this flow than other purchase organizations or is there a supplier which is um, very much involved in this flow or not okay and then there are a lot of different um, filters that you can use um, just showing quickly okay so this has uh, a sidetrack on the true uh, process mining uh, software and to have a better view okay where can i have my bigger here we go Okay, um, the following slides are about the creation of the event log. It may sound very uh, straightforward, but in fact it is actually uh, quite an art in building the correct event log. This is an overview, um, again a figure out of the book uh, of process mining, which has actually a typo in it. It needs to be ETL, extract, transform and load. So in your company, um, you can have a lot of different data sources. You can, optional, use some ETL tools to create a warehouse, but you can also go directly, extract your data out of it, and then build your event log. 
the event log in order to be mineable should be in a mineable format like access mxml or some similar um, mineable format so afterwards so you first build your event log you put a filter on it and then on your filtered event logs you can do some process discovery or you can combine the discovered process model with the event log with the data in the event log and you can combine these two into process conformance checking and again you can uh, use this conformance and use it for enhancement purposes so re-engineering your process model so here is a bit the uh, overview of what I just talked about in the picture now an event log an event log um, is built out of cases because a, a process consists out of cases the example I showed you in the software a case was a purchase order line item a case consists of events such that each event relates to precisely one case so an activity could be create purchase order but the event create purchase order is exactly for that specific case number one for example purchase order number one has been created creation of purchase order is the activity on that moment of time so very um, narrow down to to one specific activity that's what we call an event and then all these events related to a case are ordered in time based on the timestamp and apart from the timestamp there can be stored some other attributes examples of typical attribute names are activity of course the time which we need to order uh, the events and then we can have costs, resources, who did the activity, but again many more uh, attributes like for example document type or document reference etc etc. Okay. So here was this example. The case is here. The event is the combination actually um, of the timestamp the case ID, the timestamp and the activity and the person makes sure that we have a unique event uh, which is very clear here because we actually have an event ID this is an example of MXML format um, so as you can recognize a true XML um, format behind it and then um, adapted for mining access is actually um, the successor of MXML um, and the open source software uh, PROM works with both MXML and access as of version 6 it works with uh, access so this is the typology of access you have a log and a log contains of traces uh, consists out of traces and a trace consists out of events both the log the traces and the events both or so all three of them can have attributes and the attributes can have different uh, extensions so you have the five different extensions with all uh, a value okay oh sorry the extensions are over here and here are the different types of uh, attributes now what are the challenges when we are extracting event logs because as I said before it sounds very straightforward but in reality it's often not so um, first challenge is the correlation um, we need to have all different activities but that could be tied to one case but this means also that there is a high correlation between the activities also it can be that you have two activities that you think in 
first uh, point of view that would be interesting to both uh, to capture both of them but afterwards you see that there is so much correlated that each time the first activity occurs one minute later the system executes the second activity so then you may want to um, reconsider whether it's worth to actually take into account both activities also the timestamps the timestamps may be in different uh, systems then it's very important to make sure that they are aligned but also even if it's in one system you can have the difference that for one activity we only have a day for example 1st of April and for another activity we also have an hour so if you want to take into account the hour we also need to provide an artificial hour on the date of for example the 1st of April are we going to take uh, midnight are we going to take uh, 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. Uh, so 6 p.m. so these are all decisions that you have to take um, snapshots it may be that uh, you only have part of the lifetime in your event log so afterwards when you are filtering you should be you should take some decisions like do I have some cases that I only follow from half its its life cycle or do I all have uh, full life cycles scoping sometimes um, it is not that clear which tables in your uh, information system you're going to take into account or not and also gr granularity um, for example with the procurement the decision are we going to follow a complete purchase order or only a line item of a purchase order is an example of a decision on granularity choosing for the one or the other has implications for the activities that you can follow and relate to uh, the case ID so all these steps uh, and decisions have to be taken very consciously and um, thinking about all the uh, consequences that it contains so here we see a nice example of um, uh, what they call flattening reality into event logs. Um, so we have four tables. We have an order, like that, a purchase order for example. Each purchase order has a one-to-many uh, relationship to order lines. So here for example we have this order, we have different lines. Uh, oh no. This is where we take the order as um, case ID and here we take the order line as case ID. Okay? The order line can have a 0 to 1 relationship with the delivery and the delivery again can have a 0 to 1 or to many relationship with an attempt to deliver. So the decisions like, okay, which case ID am I going to take? Am I going to take an order ID as a case ID? Am I going to take an order line ID as a case ID? A delivery ID or an attempt ID? So this is not as straightforward as it might seem on first sight. Um, other examples um, life cycles of reviewers, authors, papers, etc. So in the academic can be seen as processes, um, job applications and vacancies, even x-ray machine logs. So um, in the medical uh, world uh, you can have a log of uh, the machine or the machine day, uh, what activities have been taken, etc. etc. So extracting event logs is not just something synthetical or that there is only like one correct answer or one possible event log. So different views are possible. Uh, so uh, different questions that need to be answered may require different event logs. And so the most important thing is to select the right instance notion. So am I going to take a full purchase order or a purchase or the line item for example as a case ID.
Okay, the following um, slides are about process discovery. Actually, uh, the core for the moment, certainly, um, of process mining research. So, the general process discovery problem can be described as follows. If we have an event log called L, a process discovery algorithm is a function that maps the event log L onto a process model, such that the model is representative for the behavior seen in the event log. Again, taking into account the balance between the underfitting and overfitting. We'll come back later to that. So for example here, um, we've seen this before, I'm going to um, my notebook where I can uh, write a bit. So we have activity A, we see here uh, the notation L, so this means we have a log, an event log. The event log has three traces, trace A, B, C, D, trace A, C, B, D, and trace A, E, D. The numbers 3, 2, and 1 are just the number of times this trace was found in the event log. So we can have a, che uh, a check whether the trace A, B, C, D uh, is possible to replay on this process model. So A can be uh, executed, so this would, uh, we would be consumed and we would have a token over here and a token over here. Then the log says, okay, we, have, we found a trace executing first A and then B. B is indeed possible to execute because there's a token in the incoming place. So B would consume the token of the incoming place. I will erase this and it would produce a token in the outcoming in the outcoming place. The next step in the trace is activity C. Also C is not a problem because there's a token in the incoming uh, place, so it would consume that one. I erase it again. And it would produce a token in the outgoing place. The last uh, part of this trace is to execute activity D. This is also not a problem. It would just produce a token over here and it would consume those two tokens. So erasing everything. My mouse doesn't want to cooperate with me. Okay. So A, B, C, D was not a problem. A C B D is more or less the same, only it first executes C and only then B. That was not a problem. Um, and A E D, let me point that out. So A consumes a starting token, produces a token over here and a token over here. And then the log says after A, E has been executed. Is this possible? Yes, this is possible because in both incoming places before E, there is a token. So it would consume both tokens, check, check, and it would produce tokens in all outgoing places. And then again, according to the log, after E, D has been executed. Is this possible? Yes, this is possible because in all incoming places before D, there is a token. So we would end up with a token over here at the end, and all other tokens would be consumed. Another example we have here um, is a larger log uh, file with longer traces, and we have a somewhat more uh, sophisticated process model. So let me take um, this one for example, A, B, C, E, F, B, C, D. A is, has been executed, then we will have a token over here and over here in all outgoing places. Then 
the log says that it found evidence that after a b has been executed this is indeed possible because there's only one incoming place before transaction b so the token in that incoming place would have been uh, consumed and in place 3 p3 there would be a token after b c would be <coughs> c would take place so this is again also possible there is only one incoming place before c which contains a token so token is consumed a new to new token is produced after C, E takes place. It is possible. Where is E? We find E over here. E has two incoming places, P3 and P4, and both places contain a, a token. So again, we consume the tokens. We can erase these two. And we produce a token in the outcoming, outgoing place. After E, F takes place. This is again no problem. Token can produced over here and over here. And the token and the incoming place is consumed. And then we have again B, C and D. I think we can see this. B, we would have a token over here. C, we would have a token over here. While the other two would be consumed and then as a last part D would be um, executed no problem okay so just to give you some insight in playing with the battery net very interesting okay so we focus on um, the discovery of pattern nets with the uh, process discovery algorithm that we're going to have a look at but actually the notation language is not that relevant it is to some extent uh, relevant I come back to that later but it's not that we uh, can only end up with pattern nets you can discover pattern net and then you can convert it to another language for example here uh, pattern net converted into BPMN Now, in general, there is a trade-off between four quality criteria. First of all, you have fitness. Fitness means that the discovered model should allow for the behavior seen in the event log. Okay, that's quite, quite obvious that your model should allow for the found behavior. Now, on the other hand, you can easily create a model that would allow for every behavior. Okay, um, so to compensate that, they ask for some precision. So the discovered model should not allow for behavior that is completely unrelated to what was seen in the event log. Okay, if you have an event log with all following orders like AB, 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 all traces like that, you would prefer to have a model which also combines A and then B and not says, okay, you can choose whether you first start with B or with A. Okay. Now, on the other hand, you also want to avoid overfitting. So here we go again with this balance. So you need some generalization such that the discovered model should generalize the example behavior seen in the event log. This is very difficult, but it's still very important. And simplicity is that the discovered model should be as simple as possible. So here we see this um, in a figure. So the first two, fitness, able to replay an event log and simplicity, promotes the flower model. The flower model, let me um, draw that again in my notebook. So the flower model. Can I go? Here we go. The flower model would look something like this. We have a bunch of activities. Oh, I have to click on that. 
each time again. Yeah, it should be equal. Uh, size, activity A, activity B, activity C, activity D, and activity E. And we just put one token uh, place in the middle. We combine oh, all activities with that place. And as you can see, we can form every combination of, um, of traces. Yeah. We can replay a trace A, B, C, D. There we go. A, B, C, D, but we can also say E, 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 C, D. So this is what they call the flower model. So fitness and simplicity would promote the flower model because it's very simple and it surely is able to replay the event log. But on the other hand, to uh, compensate this, we ask for generalization, so not overfitting the log and precision, which means not under underfitting the log. Now, what is the uh, process discovering algorithm uh, that we're going to have a look at here? The, the first one that was created, the more simple one, the alpha algorithm. It is. Um, it makes use of the log-based ordering relations. So it will have a look at all the traces, and uh, it will deduce the ordering relations that are present in the in the event log. So there are actually three, uh, four types of relations, or actually three. Um, so you can say if there is direct succession, you use this sign, x is directly followed by y. If x is always followed by y and y is never followed by x, you can say there is a causality, and then you draw an, uh, an arrow. If you say x is followed by y but it's also in the other way, then you have a parallel and you can choose uh, whether to first to x and then y or whether to first to y and then x and you have a uh, n split actually if you say like okay I, uh, I never have x followed by y or y followed by x then we can say we have a choice and we put it with like with a hashtag so these two actually these two combined um, are represented over here. So x can uh, have a direct succession with y and then it is or there is a causality between x and y or there is a parallel uh, function between x and y. So actually there are three types of relations. Now the first step to uh, go to process discovery is actually make a transform uh, transformation of an event log with all the traces into a footprint. So in this footprint, you put all these uh, these three relations. You're going to um, give a notation on all different combinations. So A followed by A is a combination. Um, of choice, uh, I call it choice because A is never followed by A. Now A is followed by B, but B is never followed by A. That's why we have this ordering relationship. On the other hand, here for example, B to C, we find examples that B is followed by C, but also example that C is followed by B. This means that they occur in parallel. So we have successive, in parallel, or a choice. For example, um, is there another one then on the diagonal? Um, no, can't see that. So 
So based on this footprint, the alpha algorithm builds the underlying model. So it sees, okay, we go from A, there's a direct link to B and a direct link to C. But I also see that between B and C, um, they're in parallel. So we have this construct because they can be applied in parallel. Although, um, for example, B and E, they are a choice. So you do or B or E, and that's over here. It's the same with C, C or E. Okay, so that's based on the footprint. There's a translation into the um, into the process model. So I forgot I added this animation that we have these three uh, log-based ordering relations. So this is again what I just um, told you, but here it's looked, uh, it is shown visually. So we have A followed by B, then this is inserted in the PetriNet. If we see that A is followed by B and A is followed by C and B is a, per, uh, a choice with C, then we get this construct in the PetriNet. And so there's a whole translation between combinations of log-based ordering relations in the footprint and um, formats and formats in the PetriNet. I don't know what happens. I hope it's still recording. Okay. So the alpha algorithm. Excuse me for the <laughs> for the uh, disturbing. The alpha algorithm um, looks like followed. So if we have an event log L over T, so all transactions, alpha L is defined as follows. This is a bit technical, but I wanted to include it anyway. So we have all the transactions, the transactions L which is just a collection of all the transactions that are um, that you can find in the event log. Okay. TI is just the first one of all the transactions that comes in line and TO is from T output so it's an ending transaction. Then, then we're going to search for combinations for um, combinations that can uh, be combined with places so we are looking for pairs but the, uh, the A and the B in the pair are actually collections themselves so we have A is not empty and B is not empty um, A is a collection out of the transactions that we have over here so it's a collection of activities and it's not empty and b is a collection of activities and it's part of tl and it's not empty and for all elements that belong to a and for all elements belong to b we find that there is a direct ordering relation between a going to b and the elements of A uh, underneath each other have no relationship just as the elements of B have no relationship. We will go to an example afterwards. This is, as I said, the technical part. So the um, XL is a combination of all uh, couples of collections um, where we can put a place in between. Now, there may be some duplicates in there, so YL just removes those duplicates. That's the YL. And then, that's actually the core of the algorithm, finding the XL and the YL. And the rest is actually peanuts. Um, you're going to write down all the places that you have, but the places are just actually drawing circles between all these uh, collections, that you, these couples that you find. And then the FL, is the combination um, are actually all the flaws so all the edges that you draw between 
all the circles which you mention in PL and all the rectangles uh, which you mention in TL, all the transitions. So AL, the alpha algorithm of log L, is the combination of the places, the transactions and the flaws. So this is the alpha algorithm. So this was the first algorithm of process discovery, uh, very intuitive. Um, it has some drawbacks, of course, um, it's very intuitive and gives a good insight in what process discovery actually is about. So, the, the, the very abstract part here, uh, finding places in, in XL, is visualized over here. So what we were looking for is collection of uh, a bunch of small A's and a bunch of small B's, which could be connected through, uh, through a place which combines all these A's and all these B's. We can do this, we can find this, if we have these combinations. So this is actually visualizing what's written over here. Okay. So if we would order our footprint with only all the A's, the small a's in this collection and all the b's afterwards and here the same following order we would need to end up with four quadrants in which at the upper left and the lower right we would have the hashtags the upper right we would have the arrows in that direction and the lower left we would have to have the directions uh, the arrows in that direction if we can find combinations like that we actually have these uh, combinations and we can draw uh, a place in between. So this is an example. Um, so we start actually from this foot, uh, footprint. Here is already solution and I'm going to show you uh, how we get to that. So for example here we find such a nice combination of having upper left quadrant having a hashtag the lower right also having a hashtag here we have an arrow in that direction and here in that direction so actually we can have uh, we have a couple within the first uh, collection only element A and in the second collection only element B we can find another one here for example exactly the same nice distribution so here we have C D where is them? Here, C, D. Here is another one, it's more difficult to see because actually you have to place this line below that line because the arrows are in the, in the other uh, direction, the opposite direction. So it's not D, E, but E, D that could also be an appropriate, uh, is actually an appropriate candidate. Where is E, D? Here it is. So not DE, but ED is an appropriate candidate uh, for putting a place in between. Now, as I told you in this slide before, excuse me, so YL is actually getting out, removing the duplicates that we have in XL. So that's what we're showing over here. So we here have in XL, we have um, a couple within the first collection only element A and in the second one elements both B and E but we also have here A, B and A, E so what we are going to do in Y, uh, L is going to remove those couples that's actually all we do in the step from X going to Y so we only uh, withhold this uh, couple Okay, so we do that also for A, C, E, we uh, discard the A, C and the A, E if it's over there, no, just the A, C, okay. Then we get to the battery net, um, how do we get there? I also added some colors over here, so we found this one in A, uh, in Y, L. And so it is translated into a place that, com that combines on the one side the A 
and the outgoing arcs there are two outgoing arcs one to P one to E so that's how the Y is used to build the battery net so here ACE ACE BET BE are incoming transactions and D as the outgoing and then that one so the collection Y actually holds all the combinations that are requesting for a, a place and then we just add an incoming place at the start and we add an outgoing place at the end. So that's actually the alpha algorithm. Now there are some limitations of the alpha algorithm um, and the first one is that the there's a strong assumption as that the log is complete. So um, the the generalization aspect is it's not uh, very strong there um, in producing a general model, um, and we can end up with a problem that is shown over here that we have some implicit places which are produced by uh, following the alpha algorithm, which actually in the end are not necessary for being there. For example. If you would apply the alpha algorithm on this log, you would end up with this battery net and actually P1 and P2, P2 uh, are abundant. They can be removed uh, and still re uh, return a, an equivalent battery net. Here is uh, WF net is from workflow net, which is a um, battery net is actually a type of a workflow net. Um, the alpha algorithm also has problems with loops of length 1. So what is a loop of length 1? It's just that you have at, um, a loop of only one activity. So A, B, B is a loop of length 1. Here also B, 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 B is a loop of length 1. So the result of the alpha algorithm on this uh, log would be like this. There would be no errors between the place and uh, the activity B. Of course, the correct net would include uh, the short loop. Yeah, so this is something the alpha algorithm cannot uh, deal with. Also loops of length 2. So not uh, repeating B, 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 that's loops of length 1. But B, then another activity and only then repeating the previous activity. That's a loop of length 2. So here also B, C, B, C, B, D. So again the result of the algorithm would be something like this without the loop and of course the correct net uh, would, uh, would look like this. So it's always possible A, B and then you could also go to D or you could go back via C and then go again to B. Non-local dependencies. So, if we would have a log ACD or BCE, we can see very easily that apparently there is always a C, and when it's uh, preceded by an A, it is always followed by a D. But on the other hand, when the C has been preceded by a B, it is always followed by an E, yeah, 42 times and 45 times. So it's not really a coincidence. But the alpha algorithm would not see that. It would um, create the battery net without the green dots. Now without the green uh, places, um, you could easily have B, C and then going over to D. So inserting these green places would imply that if B has been chosen, there would be a token over here and over here. So C would take place, there's a token over here and over here, and then the only option to complete is executing E, and not D because there's no token over here. So including these two places would give the perfect or perfectly fitting model, let me put it that way, for this log, but the alpha algorithm would not find it. And also a very um, 
important aspect is that frequencies are not taken into account. So this means that if here we have 45 or 42, but if it was like 99 times it's this and one time it's that, it will treat those two traces as equally important. So it's very sensitive to some noise and incompleteness in your log. I said before at a certain moment in time that we are looking for discovering a battery net and that that's not that important. But it is actually to a certain extent important because it has some representational bias. Because we cannot find models that do not fit within the Petri model PetriNet language. So in PetriNets, for example, it is not possible to have two transitions, two trans uh, activities with the same name or the same level, label or um, invisible uh, transactions. So here, for example, a simple log AA would not be discovered like this in the alpha algorithm because it's just not possible to have two times the same activity um, in a petri net so just because of this limitation within the petri net the alpha algorithm would not uh, would also not find this correct process model another example so this is an example of an invisible task so this is um, a shortcut for saying okay you can do a b c d uh, a b c sorry i'm too enthusiastic or you can say a and then i take this shortcut and it's an invisible task so it's actually no task but it's just a way of circumventing b and then doing c so you only do a nothing c so this would be a nice solution for modeling this log a b c 20 times or a c 30 times Another solution would be that you do not work with invisible tasks, but that you just duplicate. That you say, or you do A, and you go directly to this place, and then C. Or you do A, you go to this place, and you do B and C. But, as I said before, Petrinets do not allow for duplicate labels uh, in your transitions, so the alpha algorithm who is not capable of dealing with invisible tasks or duplicate tasks will end up with this algorithm which is not correct. It will not allow for traces without activity B. Because if you go like this, A, and you go over here, it will... If A is executed, you will have a token over here and over here and C can only be executed when there is a token over here which is only the case if transaction B has been executed. So, actually the challenges of the uh, alpha algorithm can be uh, uh, nicely expressed in uh, the challenge of noise and incompleteness. So, if you have rare or infrequent behavior um, and noise, your alpha algorithm is going to see it as equally important as uh, other traces and also if the event log contains too few events to be able to discover some of the underlying control flow uh, structures so it tries to capture uh, the behavior below but of course you need to have exam uh, enough examples to find this behavior as a last slide, um, I want to conclude, like, why is process mining such a difficult problem? And our researchers now already for a decade researching um, how to discover process models. One of the things is that there are no negative examples. You can only show what happens and not like um, this could not happen. That's just not possible in the, for the moment, at least not in process mining. Um, you have concurrency, so in parallel, and end splits, loops and choices. And this makes the search space, um, and the dimensions increase and increase. And so the search play space becomes very complex. And then there's also no clear relation between the size of a model and its behavior. So you can have a very small model, 
but with a lot of uh, possible behavior. Although classical analysis and evaluation methods typically assume the opposite, that if it's a small, uh, small model, you have uh, not too much behavior, and this uh, assumption does not hold. So this was uh, the end of the tutorial. I hope it was interesting, uh, that you learned a lot, and in case of any questions, um, don't hesitate to contact me or um, read the good book on process mining, and um, see you later.